So what was the homework assignment? We'll just jump right in there. Styrofoam and crystal. Styrofoam and crystal. Now why in the world would I choose styrofoam, pack and styrofoam, of all things? It's a contemporary, iconic thing. Like Jiffy Pop popcorn that pops, the, the, the very few stories carry that. It's kind of so iconic, it's a period of time. Part of being an artist is having that idea, something happens right now, and being awake to see it. Being awake to see what's around you, and look at it as not junk, like we do with the water, but think, wow. That's something. We live with that and we take that for granted. You know, if we were alive during the, the hippie era and we painted hippies, as much as we hated hippies at that time, and now we'd look back at those paintings, we'd say, you are awake, you are a genius. I lived with 32 punk rockers. Do you think I ever took, I mean, they were crazy. They had, they, one of them was wanted by the police for murder. 32 what? But she just, 32 punk rockers. You did? And Spike, yeah, I was the landlord. I own the building. And the main gal, Spike, she had hair up to here, all spiked out. That's where she got her nickname. Her normal name was Doreen. No wonder she changed her name to Spike. And she owned the lease up there, and she, she was wanted for murder, of all things. Um, that's what Spike that's you were. That's what I was living in. But do you think, and I was kind of friendly with them because I wanted them to pay the rent, and I was always, they never did, but. Um, but, the, but the thing is, if I would have said, hey, Spike, instead of coming down and pay the rent, why don't you model for me and let me paint you? And if, you know, instead of hating them, I would have, you know, used them as a model. Imagine if I would have painted all the punk, because that was such a short period of time. And it was so iconic dress and the hair and the, the, all the spikes all over the place and all of that stuff. But I wasn't awake enough. There are very few people that are, were awake to paint the 60s. How many people are painting men with their pants pulled down? Or, you know? But the thing is, that's part of our era. We're, that's been a long era. I mean, unfortunately, I'm thinking, oh, come on, this year, they, they have to come up with something new. And it's always amazing. You see the girlfriends, they're always so pretty and fixed up and all this stuff, and their boyfriends look like they just got out of bed, their pants hanging off in slippers. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you got to be awake. And so I had the homework assignment. You guys kind of averted that was bubble wrap. Bubble wrap's awesome. I mean, imagine painting bubble wrap. We take it for granted, but it's the thing that we live with right now. Packing peanuts is, again, something. It's different than, than bubble wrap because there's so many of them. So as an artist, I'm looking at going, okay, Bubble wrap and crystal. Now, it'll, quite likely, they two go together because you would have a box shipped if you're going to ship crystal. That good. But why did I choose crystal? Because bubble wrap doesn't sparkle. Now, remember, in this class, we don't paint things. So I didn't want you to paint bubble, bubble wrap or shipping peanuts. I didn't want you to paint shipping peanuts. I didn't want you to paint crystal. What are we after? Effects, right? So crystal, effects, light. So what I'm looking for, did you achieve something with the crystal as a center focal point that shimmers and glows? Now some people didn't have to do that. Some people came up with really good compositions without having the crystal. They made all of that. Now, bubble, uh, the, the, sh the shipping peanuts, they're crazy and you know the, when you get something that has these shipping peanuts in them you kind of go oh shoot when you open it up you go oh god those again because you know once you throw them in the garbage can they have a way of flying out and your whole neighborhood is filled with them you know you know so they're kind of like a burden on everything else and thank god they're trying to pass legislation to make them biodegradable but the thing is, they have these wonderful S shapes. Some of them are long and narrow. What makes shipping peanuts look like shipping peanuts? Or are, would they look like marshmallow? You know, because you know. marshmallows are kind of shaped that same way. And some shipping peanuts are different colored. Some of them are pink. Some of them are green. 
So most of them are white. We think of them as white. In fact, if you, if you think about sh um, packing peanuts, they're usually, they sprawl out. They make a pattern. And we, as artists, like eye magnets. And so what I'm looking for is taking this very loose, uh, loosey kind of product that blows away very easy and try to create eye magnets with it. Not just a pile of peanuts, but you can break that up so that you can actually put them around. If you have crystal, you can kind of use the crystal as a center focal point and put an effect on it and put a couple of the peanuts in. Now some people had to go so far as to put a box in their painting. And when you have an element like a box, it's a thing. One of the students actually, because they're trying to explain what are these peanuts? Why are they here? Why, why are you painting peanuts? It's just an element like anything else would be. In traditional, it would have been a lace tablecloth. You know, back then they're probably like, why do we have to have lace tablecloths? Why don't we just have flat tablecloths? Because lace tablecloths have some patterns. We can use that. How do you paint them? I don't know. Stare at them a while. Wait for something to happen. You know, wait for something. It won't just come and get you. You have to look for it for a while. And so one of the students said, I had crystal. I had these funny looking snake things. Ah, I'll get a box. So she tipped the box forward with the four flaps hanging outward. But then it looked like a thing. So she moved the crystal vase just enough so that the crystal was sitting on one of the lips of the boxes and the light was shining through the crystal onto the flap of the box. Mm -hmm. And here now she had this wonderful pattern on one of the flaps behind the box. Ingenious. That explained that it wasn't just a prop, it actually needed to be there. And then she had the peanuts coming out of the box and all out. And she created the, the peanuts in such a way that they led you up into the box and to the crystal. The whole thing made sense. The whole painting was thought through. That's part of what I do is try to teach you to become artists. Try to take something and make something out of it. And once it's done, you go, wow, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Well, I was interested because Jean, last time we were talking, and she said, I like the idea of taking it to the next level. And I go, well, yeah, taking it to the next level and then abstracting it to the point that it's no longer the request is a fine line. You know, so it's like, can you push it as far as you can and still have it within the realm of possibility? Maybe you're not after possibility. Like you said, for you, it's a lot more interesting to to push the envelope a little bit, right? Yeah, uh, but there's something you said to me uh, a while back about that if people don't understand it, then, then that's a problem. And, uh, and I run into that a lot with my ideas. I kind of feel like it, um, no lack of ideas, but, but then I think sometimes who's going to understand it? Mm -hmm. Just why do you worry about it, Jean? <laughs> <laughs> because we all want to look good. That's the human nature. And we fear looking bad. That's basically how we operate. Once you get an idea, it's like you can't shake it. It's like you've got to play it. You've got to do it. Yeah. And how do you know until you play all the way? Right. You know, but then you have to be willing to have people go, nice idea, but it's a little too abstract to be real. I think that's really a valid point. Um, Well, if you shipped, if you shipped me a crystal glass, yeah. what would you wrap it in? Bubble wrap. Oh, Bubble wrap or peanuts, one of those two. Okay. Okay. So, um, but the main thing is, 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 is coming up with an idea that, that is workable and then make something happen. That's what we're after is find something and then make something happen within that space. Uh, like the box and the crystal. You know, using the box flap as a way of backlighting the crystal so that the crystal caused a pattern on the leaf of the box. I said, that's an effect that's very, very interesting and we can relate to. If you take it out further than that, then it becomes abstract. And then sometimes the concept 
becomes overwhelming over the, the, what you're trying to paint. And ultimately, we're trying to do what Mrs. Gugolinsky taught us. And for those of you who don't know Mrs. Gugolinsky, Mrs. Gugolinsky was the biggest force in my life. And those of you who have taken the power to create and some of you who have taken this class, uh, she is the only artist that I hold credit to. And she was a lady. Did I, you ever hear this story? She was a lady um, I had met. There was a, a guy that uh, restored paintings and he had an original Rubens. And when he unfolded it, I looked at it and I said, there's nothing left. It was gigantic. It was a four foot by six foot Rubens. And I said, there's nothing left but a bunch of paint chips and some scratches and some paints, you know. I said, this is nothing. And he goes, you wait. He was Polish too. And so I, I, he gets it back six months later and it is like phenomenal. It looked like it just came off of one of those European churches or something. Just gorgeous. Um, and it was Christ with the coins and all this. It was just incredible painting. Um, and I said, who restored this? Who painted it? And he says he has this little old lady. She was 90 at the time. Mrs. Gugolinsky, who lived in one of the adult high-rises in the city. And I said, I need to meet this woman. And he goes, well, she doesn't speak English very good. And I said, I don't care. She's got the secret. Now, she started learning in France when they opened up the academies. And she was painting with Monet and Manet and all these artists back in that period of time. She had been painting all of her life. And at the time, we had a Polish pope 30 years ago. And uh, that was her God. That was her, her inspiration. I walked into this little apartment that was no bigger than this. There was a kitchen, a bed, and paintings stacked 10 feet deep, 10 feet high, in a little sitting area. Windows closed, painted shut in this little dorm. And I tried to call her and I said, I want to meet you, I want to meet you. And she said, you're crazy, you're crazy. I said, no, I'm not crazy. So I went and sat with her, drinking really stale old tea for hours. And I was like, Mrs. Gugolinsky, what is the, what's the secret? I'm only 21. Nobody's painting realistic art. Nobody was painting. I was going to college and getting kicked out of college because I said, I want to paint something real. And they wanted me to paint abstract. I wanted to paint like the old masters. She had the key. I said, how do you paint like that? And she turned to me and she said, paint up what you see. And I was like, oh God, come on, come up with something else. And I was naive, I was stupid, I was like, and the thing is, I was so, I wanted everything from this lady and she held the keys and she wasn't giving it to me. And after a whole day of just wrestling with her, I went home and I said, she's holding back, I need to get... So I called her up the next day. I said, would you mind if we had tea again? And I sat there. The t it's like all she would say is, paint what you see, paint what you see, paint what you see, paint what you see. That's the secret, paint what you see. And all over I'm standing around with these beautiful portraits of the Pope and portraits that she done, gorgeous museum quality stuff. But that's ultimately the one, art, one artist that I make reference to is learn to paint what you see. Everything you need is right in front of you. There's no gimmicks, there's no things that you need. Just create something and then paint it. And all you need is right there. The colors, the values, the, you just have to be awake to see it. And then I was giving a talk and I was talking about Mrs. Gugolinsky and she, they said, uh, I said, well, she said, paint what you see. And one of the persons in the audience stood up and he said, ah, yes, but once you get paint what you see, then it's about paint what you see. And this is the second half. So what we're doing in this class is not Mrs. Gugolinsky, paint what you see. We're in this class right now, paint what you see. So you're taking ordinary things and making them extraordinary. Sometimes you have to put more into it. Sometimes you have to make something happen. Because if you don't, there's nothing there. 
A painting that doesn't have any spark or fire cannot compete with one that does. If you're in a room and all the paintings are fabulous, beautifully painted, you have to do something to create magic. And believe me, there are not a lot of artists out there that know how to create magic. And it's that moment when light hits things. And so if you paint styrofoam peanuts with crystal, I think about all these dark little forms, like abstract forms, little S's and little things. And I think about all of that. And then I think about the shining crystal, the light, something to reflect that catches our eye. If you've got a beautiful reflection on a crystal, you don't need to even worry about the peanuts. They'll, they'll be there as a support. You only put the peanuts there because a crystal bowl sitting on a table all by itself is boring. So now you're using your peanuts for eye magnets. Okay. And so what's important in a composition is how you lead people there. And you need other things. If you just have something that's really beautiful by itself, you need two or three other spots because that's how we see. When I'm looking at something, I look at it. And when you have a conversation with somebody, you're looking at them, but you glance away. It's very common. In fact, it's very awkward to be looking at somebody and not glance away. After a while, they'll like go, something on my nose. <laughs> you know. So it's very common for us to dart around. If something's more interesting over here, we could end up, if I'm looking at you and somebody's being murdered back there, I'm going to stop looking at you and I'm going to be paying attention to what's back there. But if it's not that interesting, if it's just a fleeting dog running or something, I'll catch it and I'll come back to you. And so the other things in the painting need to be that immediate. Oh, that's interesting. Back. So those are the secondary focal points that you need. You need at least three of them to keep the painting interesting. So you would have a little bit of light on some of the peanuts. One here, one here. Then you have the mother load, the, the, the crystal that's lit up. Beautiful, sparkle. That's what I'm looking for. But I don't know, maybe somebody's come up with something else. In this particular painting I'm referenced to, it's the, the lid of the box that becomes the star because that's the surface that the crystal throws its wonderful shadow on. And I go, God, that's great, because now we're not even looking at the crystal anymore, we're looking at the lid of the box. And it needed to be in there. So that's, that's what I'm saying. You, could, you don't have to be clever. You just have to think it up. I'm Stefan Bauman. Welcome to the Grand View. America's National Parks through the eyes of an artist.